As music listeners, not just as songwriters, I think we all had the experience of hearing songs that have a really killer bridge and feeling like the bridge is one of the things that makes the song fantastic. But writing a bridge can be difficult and really getting that variation or contrast to work in the song is a challenge. So in this video, what I want to do is talk about three chord strategies that we can use to write great bridges. Just before I jump in, I want to let you know that we have some live online songwriting workshops coming up. The link and details are in the video notes below. All right, so let's jump in to talk about bridges. Before we actually look at our three chord strategies, I want to define a bridge to start with, okay, and talk about what are the characteristics of a bridge and what are the functions of a bridge. So let's define a bridge. A bridge is a section of music that provides contrast or variation, which is basically to say it's a section that is different musically and lyrically to anything we've heard before in the song. So a bridge is coming in once we've heard sections repeat and it's there to inject a sense of novelty or variation that really freshens the ear and freshens the palate of the listener <laughs> to hear something repeating come back after it. Normally the ear of a listener is ready to hear that kind of variation after they've heard two song systems repeat. So what is a song system? A song system is the combination of a verse and a chorus that creates one structure that then repeats, okay? Or in a song that has a pre-chorus, the song system is the verse, pre-chorus and chorus, the package of that little structure that then repeats itself. So the ear is ready for variation after we've heard two song systems repeat. This really calls to mind the golden ratio in music. And the golden ratio is A, A, B, A. And we see this golden ratio appear when we're talking about song form, which is what we're talking about. But it also occurs when we talk about melody, when we talk about rhyme, for example, it comes up a lot in music. So A, A, B, A really just represents a pattern of repetition and variation. And what it's telling us is something really crucial about the human psychology of listening, which is that twice is nice, but three times is too much. <laughs> so the ear of a listener loves to hear repetition and almost exact repetition, like something repeat almost exactly, because that repetition creates familiarity and familiarity creates comfort and also a sense of sympathetic resonance of the body. We love repetition, but we don't love too much repetition, okay? Which is where the B comes in. So the B is telling us that once we've repeated something exactly, the ear of a listener is potentially going to disengage if we try and repeat the same thing again. We need to inject some kind of variation, but that variation creates a complete refreshment of the ear so that if we want to, we can come back and repeat something we've already heard and that that return to the repetition is actually going to feel extra good because we're returning to something familiar via something new, something refreshing, something different. So the ear of a listener loves to hear two song systems, but then something different. And a bridge section is a great solution to that requirement of the ear to hear something change or vary up at that moment in the song form. The other really important characteristic of a bridge that's worth mentioning is a bridge will typically only happen once where the other sections kind of repeat themselves. Okay, so now that we've talked about the characteristics and function of a bridge section, let's dig into our three chord strategies for writing great bridges. Now these strategies are in increasing levels of harmonic complexity and there's a bit of assumed knowledge. So if you're watching this, I'm assuming that you're relatively comfortable with diatonic chords in the major key and the minor key. If you want a bit of a refresher on those concepts, you can check out this video, which talks about the chords in the major key, their functions and relationships to each other. And then you can check out this video, which is basically the same thing in the minor key. Strategy one, change from the relative major to the relative minor. So this strategy assumes two things. The first thing that it assumes is that the section 
immediately before the bridge has a really strong sense of the tonic and that's actually like a really good thing a really good tonal strategy to make sure that the tonic is really clear in your section before the bridge and let's assume for practical purposes that we're going to the bridge from a chorus so we're saying that the chorus is going to have a strong tonic and one of the clearest ways we can enforce that is making the first chord of the chorus the tonic chord so let's say the first chord of our chorus is c major bam c major okay so if our chorus is really in c major and that's really clear the second assumption is that no other section in the song has started on the relative minor because if i've used the relative minor already the a minor for example to start a pre-chorus it's not going to be as effective so let's assume firstly our chorus section has a really strong nice major tonic let's also assume that we haven't started any other section on our a minor we are saving the relative minor for the bridge section and that's really at the heart of this strategy so i'm going to show you an example from a song that i wrote a while ago now called last call and the verse section starts on the major tonic and ends on the major tonic which means starting the bridge section on the relative minor is really going to sound like we're traveling to a new place so i'll play for you the section before the bridge leading into the bridge you're laughing too loud talking at a shout using the music as your alibi your charming quirks yeah they had their perks but now the price has risen too high i've done what i can i've played my hand oh i've given it my Darling, when I hang up the phone, that'll be my last call. Yeah, you're brittle, you're broken, I'm feeling a little unsure. But this shadow is too dark to ignore. So you can really see and feel and hear in this song. I think that this tonic major center is very strong. So this is a song in the key of F sharp, right? So it really starts on F sharp here, but I'm doing sort of interesting things here, but I'm always kind of really on the F there. And then it just goes down to the dominant chord and then that repeats itself, right? But it keeps kind of coming back to the, to the tonic there. And then in the second half of the verse section, yes, I do start on the relative minor, okay? And then it kind of moves up back to the major tonic, back down to the relative minor. But then crucially what happens is we cadence at the end. Dominant chord back to one. And so it's really establishing the major tonic at the beginning and at the end of the section. So our ear is really, really hearing that major tonic very strongly throughout this whole section. Then we go into the B section. Now the first chord of the B section is the relative minor, a D sharp minor chord that then goes through this other similar little thing, which I'm gonna talk about as our second strategy here. But the most important thing is starting on the relative minor. So a really beautiful example from kind of contemporary music history is the song Yesterday by the Beatles. So let's take a listen to the transition from the A section into the bridge, which is in the relative minor. Oh, yesterday came suddenly Why she had to go I don't know Strategy number two is to use a line cliche in your bridge. So line cliches are a particular type of harmony, which we actually just saw in the song I played a view of mine called Last Call. So I'm going to explain to you what a line cliche is and then show you another beautiful bridge with a line cliche in it, which is inside the song Nothing by Bruno Major. Okay, so a line cliche is when you take a chord, so let's take the chord B minor here. Now in this particular voicing on the guitar, I've got the root of the chord here, and I've also got the B here an octave up. So what's gonna happen in a line cliche is I hold the B minor chord stable, except for one note that is gonna move in half steps inside the chord, okay? 
So here, I'm gonna keep this B stable. This B, I'm gonna move in half steps descending, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do from this B minor chord is move this B down a half step here, which creates what's called a B minor major seven chord. I then move it another half step down simply by lifting that middle finger, which creates a B minor seven chord. And if I wanted to continue the line cliche, I could. I have to sort of change my shape there to get a B minor six chord, right? But that is a beautiful minor chord line cliche that keeps the chord stable except for this one note that's moving down in half steps and that's what creates the sound of a line cliche so that's a really classic minor chord line cliche we can also play major chord line cliches so i'll play it from the d major here okay so if i'm in the key of d major or even if i'm just playing a d major chord in any key i can probably get away with it so i've got d major here i've got d I've got D there as well. I'm gonna hold the root, the base D stable, and I'm gonna move this D down in half steps, which gives me this chord progression. And here I've arrived at a D dominant seven, which really wants to go down a perfect fifth to the G chord. Right, so a perfect fifth down from D is G and that's really the progression that you'll hear a lot using this beautiful major chord line cliche and then if we're Paul McCartney we go to G minor and then back to D and then probably to A dominant 7 back to D okay but the key thing there is really that line cliche thing that moves down in half steps from the root of the chord. Okay, so line glitches are really beautiful. They're a really nice sound to inject into a bridge because it adds uh, an element of chromaticism, which adds a flash of color that's outside the key while still really holding a chord that's in the key. So you get the best of both worlds. You get something inside the key and something outside the key. So let's have a listen to the bridge of the song Nothing by Bruno Major, which is exactly in this key. The, most of the song is in the key of D major except when we get to the bridge which goes into the relative minor which we're calling back to strategy one but the thing I want you to hear here is the line cliche so shut all the windows and lock all the doors we're not looking for no one Line cliches, really pretty. Let's move on to our third and final strategy. Introduce a modal chord. Now don't freak out about the music theory component of this, okay? If you're not someone who has a ton of music theory behind you, don't worry. You don't actually need a ton of music theory to really access this and put it into practice really quickly and have it sound really excellent. So let's use the Mixolydian mode to demonstrate this, okay? So Mixolydian is a fancy word for something very simple, okay? A mode is nothing more than a scale and Mixolydian is nothing more than the major scale with a flat seven. So where the major scale is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, Mixolydian is one, two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, one, that's it. That's the only difference between the major scale and the Mixolydian mode. The only layer of real complexity here comes when we build Mixolydian chords that are diatonic to that scale, which means that the chords will contain that flat seven note, not the natural seven note that we're used to hearing in the major scale. So there are a few chords that come out of Mixolydian that are different to the chords in the regular major scale. And the two chords that are the most musical and most usable and sound just fantastic are the five minor chord and the flat seven major chord.
So let's put that into context in terms of the chords in a key, and then I'll play it for you and show you how to use it. So if I'm in the key of C, normally the five chord would be a G dominant seven chord, and the seven chord would be a B diminished chord, or if I were playing it as a diatonic seventh chord, it would be a B half diminished chord. One of the key reasons, of course, that those chords have those chord qualities is because they contain the note B natural. But in Mixolydian, we don't have a B natural, we have a B flat. So if I am constructing a chord out of the notes of C Mixolydian, starting from G, I'm going to have the notes G, B flat, and D, which give me a G minor chord. And if I add the diatonic seventh on top, which is gonna be an F natural, I have a G minor seven. So in Mixolydian, I have this beautiful G minor seven chord, which I'm gonna experiment with throwing into the mix in my bridge. The other great chord I have is a flat seven major. So of course, if I'm building the diatonic Mixolydian chord from the B flat, I'm gonna have a B flat, a D natural, and an F natural, which gives me a B flat major chord. So I'm still in the key of C, but what I'm doing in the bridge section is borrowing some chords from C Mixolydian. So I'm starting to use some modal chords, some C Mixolydian modal chords inside the bridge of my song, which is still in the key of C. So I'm going to play a little chord progression in the key of C, something really tonal to the major key. And then what I'm going to do is introduce the B flat major chord and it's going to really feel like it's introducing some new color into the pan and it's going to kind of take the ear somewhere slightly different. So here's our very C major progression. Again. slightly more complex version of modal borrowing or using modal chords is instead of using chords borrowed from C Mixolydian, which is essentially just a different flavor of a major scale, I can borrow chords from the C minor scale. So this is different from relative major and minor scales. This is now talking about parallel major and minor scales. The difference with relative major and minor is that the tonal center changes. So if I'm in C major, the relative minor is A minor. The tonal center shifts. With parallel modes, the tonal center doesn't shift. So I'm gonna be borrowing chords not from A minor, but from C minor. So let's have a look at the chords in the key of C minor. The chords that I particularly love to borrow are the flat three major, the flat six major, and the flat seven major, and of course the four minor. Now the four minor chord is quite a typical chord of modal borrowing, very, very beautiful, and it sounds like this. So many of the chords from the parallel minor sound really, really beautiful. And it's a very dramatic type of modal borrowing because we're really going from the brightness of a major key to the darkness of those modal mi minor chords. We're not actually going into C minor. We're just looking to borrow a couple of the chords without fully kind of modulating into C minor. <laughs> Thank you. 
So in that example, I used a combination of the flat six major seven and the flat seven major chord to really construct the bridge. And I centered the whole bridge progression around those two chords, chucking in a few other chords from C major to still ground the ear in the key of C major, but to continue throwing in those beautiful modal chords, which really transport the ear into a slightly darker place, but that transitions really nicely back into that C major progression. So there you have it friends, three chord strategies for constructing great bridges. We have changing from the relative major to the relative minor, using line cliches and introducing modal chords. And of course you can experiment with all three if you like. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something. If you did, please leave us a comment. And if you'd like YouTube to let you know when we release new content, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Happy writing, I'll see you soon. Thank you.